Good morning, everyone. That's a little harder to hear, so I'm going to use my preaching voice today. <laughs> That's okay. So, so glad to be here today. I'm thankful for your ministry, for what you're doing in your different contexts. And uh, yes, my area is the area of multicultural ministries. I have a strong passion for reaching people of other ethnic groups. I dare to say that probably every one of you are exposed in some way to, to an immigrant. Is that right? In your schools, uh, I've seen quite a change in the years that I've pastored in terms of ethnicity within our, within our churches and within our schools. And uh, I'm just, uh, just thankful that I have this responsibility to uh, give information about it. And today I'm going to share a Bible study with you on PowerPoint. And we're going to do a Bible study itself uh, based upon Genesis chapter 16. But before we do, before we begin, let's have prayer and ask God's blessing over us, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful so much for the opportunity we have this morning to be able to learn from your word. Teach us, Lord, the things we need to learn as far as re reaching out to people of different backgrounds. And we pray from this lesson that we learned today from the word of God, it will help us to be more, more effective in our work and more sensitive to the needs around us. So bless us now and guide us. This we ask in your precious name. Amen. As you can see, the title of my message is The God Who Can See Me, An Immigrant Story. Let's see. And we're going to have a reading. Chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maid servant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maid servant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maid servant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your servant is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. She answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now a child, and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael. The Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. It is still there between Hamish and Beer. So Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Chapter 15. Let's move it here. Now, sir. So the question is the story of, of the story is obviously one of a person that we all know well, uh, the story of Hagar. Bound, bound in, found in chapter 16 of Je Genesis. Um, think about it for a moment. Agar, who was she? Well, interesting enough, as you know, the background of the story, among the things that, uh, uh, among the things and people that Hagar, that Abraham received, or Abram received, was a, was a slave, an Egyptian slave, and her name was Hagar. At least that's what she's called. Uh, however, that's a Hebrew name. Interesting when you do through these, when you go through the story, 
the name Slay, the name Hagar, was a Hebrew name, which means she was not addressed by her Egyptian name. And the name they gave her was a name that represents alien as the title of her name. One commentary, one commentary states that we don't know her real name. She's really simply referred to as a foreign thing, a foreign thing. So if you can imagine being called a foreign thing instead of being referred to as a, as a true uh, person with her real name. In the Bible, names are important in scripture. Uh, names represent identity. Uh, names represent p uh, worth of people. For example, Abraham was, uh, Abram was changed to Abraham, known as father of many nations. Israel was a name that represents struggle with God. Daniel was a name that represents God is my judge. David, his name was beloved. It's Emmanuel, obviously mean God's with us. And Simon, of course, his name was changed to Peter, which means the rock. Uh, Abraham and Sarai never uttered Hagar's birth name. They chose to call her by the term that refers to enslaved status. Uh, when you read through the scripture and reading it through carefully, especially when you read not only Genesis 16, but Genesis 21, you can tell that Hagar was not well respected by her, uh, by her master, uh, known as Sarai. Uh, interesting, there's some words that are used there. It says, cast her out, bondsman, bondswoman with her son. Get rid of that slave or her son, different translations. Drive out this slave and her son. Uh, it's unfortunate that in the story of Hagar, while it does say that Hagar uh, despised her, and then, of course, uh, Sarai decided to get rid of her, really the background to it was one, uh, an idea of offensiveness, of slavery, of feeling offensive towards, towards this particular woman. Let's see here. Names are offensive. Here are examples of names here. Uh, interesting enough, uh, when you think about it, uh, there's sub-stories of situations that have happened uh, where people didn't realize the names were offensive. For example, the word Eskimo. Uh, back in, uh, when you go up to the north in the area of uh, uh, Alaska and also at Canada, the word Eskimo is an offensive name. Uh, they, in fact, they decided to discontinue it uh, because of the fact that it just didn't appear the right uh, name to use, and they felt it was offensive to them. We know that the Edmonton football team, uh, while they were going through the process of determining a new name, they decided to instead of call, a, uh, call, uh, call it Eskimo, call, them, call, uh, call it to discontinue the name itself, Eskimo. There were Washington Redskins. Uh, they were, that was offensive to those who were Indians because they were referred to them uh, in back in the old days as just people that they could scalp, the scalp of their ancestors. It was really an R word in the context of the Indians today. Uh, Indian, uh, the word illegal alien is something that's used sometimes here in our country. Uh, it was applied before among Jews. Uh, Jews in, the, in Germany were called as illegal and not, not deserving to live in, the U, in their particular country in Germany. And here's an interesting uh, term that's used here uh, by Eli Wiesel, his comment, his thoughts on this. He said this, those who are so-called illegal aliens must know that no human being is illegal. That is a contradiction of terms. Human beings can be beautiful or more beautiful. They can be fat or, or, or skinny. They can be right or wrong. But illegal, how can a human being be illegal? So the idea and the concept of uh, this particular woman, Hagar, uh, not deserving respect, was why they gave her the name of uh, Hagar. Let's see here. Hagar was in a desperate bind. Sarai complains about her. And Abraham finally tells her, do as to her as you please. So the Bible says Sarai dealt harshly with her. In her pregnancy, Hagar flees to the wilderness. Here she is, a woman, a foreigner, a slave, forced into pregnancy by her conniving mistress, 
and a man who probably she probably didn't even love. So, and as a result of we, uh, what happened, she was feeling so depressed and so bad about it that she decides to leave. And when she decides to leave, she flees, and guess where she's going back? According to the story, it looks like she's going back towards Egypt. She's leaving where she is and going towards Egypt. And she goes to the situation as she's leaving. She's feeling very depressed, very, de very disrespected, and feeling alone, and feeling like she doesn't mean anything. The Bible says that the, the foreigner means God. This particular foreigner, a person who is not of Hebrew, meets God. And by the way, interesting enough, the, uh, the commentators say this is the first annunciation uh, of a person, in which in this case, by God, uh, towards this person. And this person isn't even a Hebrew. She's a foreigner. And so when God meets her, uh, he asks a question. Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Where are you going? So you can imagine the situation. She's feeling very deprived, feeling alone, not knowing where to, uh, what will happen to her because she's heading back towards, towards Egypt, which is a long way from, from home, from where she was. She replied, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, you must go back to your mistress and submit to her mistreatment. Go back to your mistress. So here she's being asked to do something that she really didn't want to do. She was originally in a slave condition, disrespected. She goes back, and God herself says, says, to, her, says to her, you know, I see you. I understand what you're going through. But you must go back to your mistress and submit to her mistreatment. Now, Hagar is on her way back to her family in Egypt. But God stops to speak to this immigrant, pregnant, fugitive slave. Hagar becomes the first person in the Bible, after the Garden of Eden, to receive an appearance from God. Now, notice that God calls her by her name and invites her to speak, to tell her story. But then he tells her, go back, go back, go back. Why did God tell her to go back? First, he tells her that the best future of her son starts not in Egypt, but with the one with the one God who made a covenant. She was not going to go back to the foreign gods. She was to go back to the area where she would learn more of the true God. He also tells her her name uh, to name her son Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. So you can imagine for a moment Sarah, uh, Hagar hearing God, being exposed to by God. When back in those days, they thought if you're exposed to God, you die. But here, God says, I know, I hear you. I hear your affliction. And so God then promises this non-Hebrew slave to girl from this son that from this son will come innumerable descendants. So she said, he says, you're going to have a son. And you're going to have a son that will give more sons. And so you will have descendants to come on uh, from, your, from this particular uh, birth. Now here is an interesting uh, interesting. Uh, study of the word here, of what happens here. In the Hebrew, the word God that she gives him, she gives him a name called El Roy. Hagar gave this name to the Lord who had spoken to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, here I have seen the one who sees me. So here she is all alone, a, sor a foreigner, disrespected, not sharing where to go. God responds to her and tells her, Listen, you're going to have sons, you're going to have children, but you must go back and receive the help, uh, receive uh, the, the lessons that you will learn about God. And she says, I have seen you. And he calls her the God who sees me, the God who sees me. Hagar reminds us that God sees the suffering of those society, of those society is used and cast aside that he sees the humanity of those, that it is more convenient for us to dehumanize because they remind us that we are not as righteous as we like to think. You know, it's interesting that in this story, Hagar, we, hear, we see the story of God sees people of other backgrounds, of other ethnicities. And she learns a lesson. 
And the lesson is that, that uh, God sees those who are, who are different from us, but yet they're children of God too as well. And that when we, uh, we see another person, don't see them as someone who is uh, to be less respected, but see them as children of God, as someone that God loves too as well. I'm going to close here with an interesting video. Uh, interesting video. And by the way, my background in, uh, in, uh, in working with immigrants is a personal one for me because when I was pastoring in Fort Wayne, Indiana, I got a phone call from an agency. It was a Catholic agency. And the Catholic agency said that they had a family they wanted to place with us uh, in the town of uh, Fort Wayne. And I said, well, where are they from? They're from Myanmar. I said, Myanmar? I'd never heard of Myanmar, actually. Uh, she said, it's Burma. Oh, yeah, Burma. I didn't know it had a name called uh, a different name. It says, yeah, Myanmar. And she, what, she, what she told me about them was interesting. They're a tribe from a tribe known as Karen. I said, Karen? I'd never heard of Karen either. And I said, well, they're a tribe that were persecuted by the people, uh, uh, by, by the government there in Myanmar. And they have been in... Uh, they've been a refugee camp for over 16 years, and they're in Thailand, and they're wanting to, they're wanting to come to the U.S. All these different peoples, uh, uh, thousands of people were there that, in that, uh, particular, uh, that particular refugee camp. In this one particular family, uh, they, uh, they were finally able to get them the help that they needed to get, be able to come back to the U.S. And I said, okay. I said, so why are you calling me? And as she said, well, the reason I'm calling you is because they identify themselves as Seventh-day Adventists. So, oh, really? Seventh-day Adventists? Yes. They're, so these Seventh-day Adventists are coming from Thailand to Fort Wayne, Indiana? I said, yes. I said, whoa, okay. Uh, and so uh, she said, would you be able to support them for the time that they come initially? And I said, well, okay, let's, uh, let me talk with my board about this. So this is back around, I think, 1999. Uh, when I got the call, uh, actually maybe 2000, 2000, the year 2000. So uh, I meet with the board and I bring them the, the dilemma uh, that this family is facing. And I get this call uh, from this agency and they're wondering if we'd be willing to sponsor them because they're coming to Fort Wayne. And I explained to them that they are coming particularly to Fort Wayne for two reasons. One, because Fort Wayne at the time was the largest group of, immig of uh, Karen in the country. Uh, existed in Fort Wayne, which I didn't know that. And so there are quite a few uh, Karen, a lot of them uh, going, uh, attending Lutheran or Catholic churches uh, sponsored by them. But this particular family is Seventh-day Adventist. And I remember there were a couple of people who said, well, do we really want to get into this? Do we really want to deal with this at all? I mean, we don't know these people at all. That was a couple of people that mentioned it, uh, had that comment. And, you know, they, they had strong voices, too. But then finally, uh, one particular person, who happened to be my uh, community services person, a person of deep compassion, she said, you know, they're family. And because they're family, I think we should support them. We should support them. So we did. So we support, uh, so uh, the board voted to go ahead and support them. We brought them over to the, uh, we brought them over to the, uh, to the apartment and they arrived at the airport and we received them there. They were very scared at the time, remember that. And then we brought them from the airport to the apartment. And the apartment, I was surprised to see. I didn't, I didn't see what they had done. But I saw, I saw they, entirely, they had furnished the apartment entirely with furniture. They put food in there for them. They had it all set up. And it was interesting to note the reaction of those who were there with us, who were Karen, but they were, that spoke the language, they were bilingual, so we were able to translate to them what we were wanting to say to them, and we would hear from them. And the ones who were long time established Karen, who had been right, lived there for some time, they looked at this particular family, and they looked at us and said, wow, they truly do care for you. They truly do care for you. And you know, when you think about it, uh, I think that's the story that God wants us to have is to truly care for those who we minister to, especially those of different backgrounds. So I'm gonna close with this particular story here to illustrate again how God can use a family.
Looking back in the past 35 years of my life, I realized that I was focused on success at work and that left me very little quality time for serving God. The result was that, guess what? I made more money, but I didn't do ministry the way I knew I should be doing it, thinking that, oh, well, I'm young. I have more time. So 30s turns to 40s, 40s turns to 50s, and now I'm in my late 50s. Finally, I'm trying to flip it in the right direction, spending quality time doing God's work. The process of identifying which ministry my wife and I should select was very important to us. I mean, we put a lot of thought into it. So when we discovered that over 600 refugees come to our city every year, we felt compelled to participate. So we have a family for you. They are from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. And it's a family of seven, and they're all girls. Wow. So the DRC, it's been civil wars within the country, and that's why they've had to flee. The family arrives this Thursday night. Everything's going to be new to them, and they're really going to need a little bit of stability, and we all offer that. We've got an apartment, and we need to set it up. Would y'all be interested in being involved in that sure. process? Yeah. The way I'm wired, it's important to me to not be involved in huge events that are Billy Grahamish. I'm not made for the spotlight. I'm prone to pride, and that's what I have to fight. So put me in a spot that doesn't foster that, and that's where the Lord is putting us. When I read scripture, I see that it is incumbent upon all Christians to love God and to love others. Jumbo. Jumbo. Someone who shows up and didn't think he would ever get there, and he came here by the skin of his teeth, and he knows not what the future holds. That to me is a ripe situation to love others, and I want to be part of it. You want to see it? You want to go see? One bedroom here. And their bedroom is here. So mom and dad, you sleep here, and then someone else sleep here. I think the little one. The little one, yeah. Love is not all that complicated. It's actually quite simple. It sort of looks like making yourself very helpful to the people in your life. Some people need a soft word. Some people need a couch. Some people need a friend. Tell them that I'm sure they've had a long trip, but they're home, and we're glad that they're home. They're happy to know that they have people who really care about them, and people want to help them. Yeah, yeah. Yes. They, they think that they're going to keep seeing you in their lives. They want to see you again. Tell her yes, yes. When you're my age, you realize the weight of idolatry and realizing that other things have been more important and have taken the place of God. But at the same time, what I am encouraged about is the direction of my life. I will befriend this family. I will become aware of needs. I will pray for this family. Where that will lead, I'm not sure. Everybody's aiming at something. It's incumbent upon us to know what is that and what should it be. My aim in life is what God wants, what brings Him pleasure, what is His desire.
What is his desire, God's desire? Love one another. Love one another and care for one another. By the way, we're very thankful that we uh, started, we started pastoring or ministering to that family because now we have a Karen Seventh-day Adventist church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So it's worth it. And thank you, by the way, for what you're doing in ministry. I know you have a number of students from different backgrounds, and so I pray that God will bless what you're doing there in the schools that you're attending to. So let me close with prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, wonderful God, we're so grateful, Lord, for the fact that you have called us truly to see each other as one, the body of Christ. You called us from different backgrounds and ethnicities to support and encourage one another and help us in our desire to grow in love with you. So I pray, Lord, for the ministry taking place in our schools. There are children there attending those schools who come from different backgrounds and ethnicities, and they have a need, Lord, a need to learn about you, and learn about life, to learn from the things that they are taught. And I pray, Lord, that as we minister to them, that you will help us to see them as your children, as the children that need to be grown into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And I pray that the ministry that we do will reflect that love that you have for us towards others. So I pray your blessing for each and every school represented here. The ministry is taking place, and I pray the fruit of that will be a family of God waiting to receive you when you come again. So bless us, Lord, and guide us in our work. This we ask and pray in your precious and wonderful name. Amen.